Welcome to another episode of Marxist Voice, podcast of the communists in Britain. This episode will be listening to another talk from 2023's Revolution Festival, this time with Ben Curry discussing and defending the Enlightenment. In the age of the Enlightenment, the young, ascendant capitalist class began to stretch its wings against the spiritual dictatorship of the church and the feudal monarchies that they propped up. Breaking the chains of obscurantist medieval dogma, bold thinkers and pioneers like Locke, Newton, Diderot and Rousseau fought for rationality and science, and in so doing, theoretically cleared the ground for the great bourgeois revolutions. Today, however, capitalism is decrepit and dying, and the ruling class has turned away from the reason of its youth. In fact, the irrational capitalist system threatens to drag human society back to a new dark age. Therefore, as Ben will explain, despite its limits, we as Marxists lay claim to the bold materialism and clarity of thought which characterized the Enlightenment as theoretical armaments in our own struggle against our rotten ruling class. Without further ado, this episode of Marxist Voice, brought to you by the revolutionary communists in Britain. Well, Alan on Friday uh, explains that we as communists, we're not just fighting for uh, a world in which everyone has what they materially need. We are fighting for um, a, a world in which, every, in which people can really begin to spiritually develop themselves, in which the doors of culture uh, are flung open to the masses um, so that they, they have access to art, science, philosophy, all of these things that are excluded to them under capitalism. But today, capitalism threatens humanity with a huge throwback of culture. It's threatening to, to drag art, science, and literature into the abyss with them. And uh, really, uh, 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 there's an ex excellent symptoms of the, the, the complete dead ends, the impasse of capitalism in the halls of universities, because it has become now the, uh, uh, all the rage in academia to denigrate, to slander, and to reject what they call the Enlightenment project. That is, the, the, the capitalist class and its thinkers in the, the ivory towers of universities increasingly tends towards rejecting the great heritage and achievements of the, of the capitalist class itself and its thinkers in its, in its, in its youth, basically. This has become, uh, as, as I'll come on to, I'll name a few of the uh, examples of these, uh, these academics of the modern day. But let us start by looking at the context in which the Enlightenment arose. Now, as Marx and Engels explain in the Communist Manifesto, capitalism played the most revolutionary role in history in its youth. It completely revolutionized industry and commerce and trade it broke up feudal relations on the land, uh, and it dragged huge populations out of rural isolation. And it also revolutionized uh, human thinking. Uh, science received an unprecedented impetus from uh, the, the, the developments of industry and trade, and, and, and philosophy and all areas of human culture also developed alongside that. And these, these revolutionary changes that capitalism brought about completely few through the feudal system uh, that had dominated Europe for a millennium completely out of balance. And did the feudal lords and the old monarchies of Europe have the good sense to go into the, the dustbin of history quietly? No, of course not. Just like the capitalist class of today, they, uh, they, 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 they fought against every threat to their rule and privilege. Um, the old feudal ruling class, they, they instigated reigns of terror. They instigated inquisitions, religious wars, drowned Europe in, in, in blood. Parts of Germany were, deep, were nearly depopulated, 50% collapse in population in some parts of Central Europe. And uh, the church didn't just silence religious heresies, but they silenced every form of opposition. 80,000 witches were burned at the stake. Um, and uh, 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 scientists were also uh, uh, persecuted by the church. Galileo, of course, was forced to recant his views. Uh, Giordano Bruno, the most modern thinker, uh, it would be incredible just to give a lead off on just what he stood for. Uh, he, was, he, he, was, uh, 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 he refused to recant his views and he was burnt at the stake uh, uh, by the Catholic church. And alongside this, the church also put together a, a long list of banned books, the Papal Index. Um, and the more irrational their system became, basically, the more rationality, reason, and science themselves became the enemy from the point of view of this, uh, this old uh, ruling class. And their system wasn't just becoming irrational, it was becoming downright surreal. The closer, the more feudalism had exhausted itself, uh, the more deserving it was of being overthrown, the more the old monarchies that had dominated Europe for centuries concentrated power in their hands, just like the capitalist state is concentrating power in its hands, uh, the, the more uh, it is in conflict with the needs of society. You had uh, the rise of autocracies. Uh, Louis XIV in France 
demanded that his subjects refer to him as the Sun King, the literal center of the universe. Uh, so that's how irrational and surreal this system was becoming. And so it was a time in all respects like our own, in the sense that the old order, the Ancien Regime, was choking the pores of society and it was threatening to bring civilization down into the abyss with it. And it was a time, of course, in which earth-shattering revolutionary events were being prepared. And the crowning of all of that was, of course, the Great French Revolution of 1789 to 1793. But revolutions don't spring from the ground ready-made. The ground is prepared for them, and the minds of men are prepared for those revolutions. And, and you had that in this period. Revolutionary thinkers emerged who, who subjected the old society to merciless criticism. They developed programs of action. You had pamphleteers that were agitating amongst the masses for these revolutionary ideas. Uh, just as we're meeting here today, you had across uh, uh, Ancien Regime France, you had salons and clubs meeting and discussing these bold revolutionary ideas. And to begin with, these ideas were the property of an advanced guard. They were isolated from the masses. Their ideas, they seemed shocking and extreme to the people of those days. But uh, at the decisive moment, because these ideas answered the needs of the historical moment, it was these ideas that gripped the masses. Uh, it was under the, the banner of reason, liberty, equality, the rights of man that the French Revolution, of course, was, was fought. And these thinkers provided that thinking conscious element, which is vital to all revolutionary movements. Um, and I'm, of course, I'm referring to the boldest, most revolutionary thinkers that formed the vanguard of that great uh, intellectual movement known as the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment, uh, in, in opposition to faith, to superstition, and to the irrational remnants of feudalism, they raised on their banner reason. That was their rallying cry, reason, uh, effectively. And they believed for, if, that there were many thinkers. There were more moderate and there were more radical thinkers, and they had a diversity of views. But fundamentally, what linked them was the belief that human beings are naturally endowed with reason, that reason can be used to understand nature and society, and that placed at the feet of humanity, this understanding can liberate human beings. Um, we can develop a rational morality, a rational law and social system, at a time when the, the, the existing social system depended upon the justification of the divine rights of monarchies to rule. This was a revolutionary challenge to say that we need a rational system based upon reason. Um, and of course, we know that in actual fact, they were blazing a trail for the rule of capital. They were blazing a trail for the rise of capitalism. But they didn't necessarily understand that their fight in those terms. They were fighting sincerely for human liberation. They were not, um, uh, they were not actuated, they were not uh, inspired by the, 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 the desire for money and acquisition and petty uh, uh, things that we associate with capitalist motivation. They were inspired by the most noble, uh, um, high-spirited motivations that any revolutionary thinkers have ever been uh, inspired by. And, uh, um, and I will give the word over now to uh, a great thinker from the Enlightenment, Immanuel Kant, who, who, who was writing at the high point of this, uh, this period, who in 19, uh, seven, 1984, 1784 uh, wrote a, uh, a short article titled, What is Enlightenment? And I think he sums up the spirit of, of the Enlightenment brilliantly. He says, on all sides I hear, do not argue. The officer says, do not argue, drill. The taxman says, do not argue, pay. The pastor says, do not argue, believe. So the ruling class were demanding ignorance and passive obedience from the masses. And in opposition to this, Kant raises what he calls the slogan of the Enlightenment, sapere aude, which is Latin for dare to know. That was the, that was the spirit of this period, dare to know. It was a daring, scientific, defiant, revolutionary spirit that, that had the most fertilizing effect on a galaxy of the most brilliant thinkers imaginable. From the 17th through to the, uh, the, the end of the, uh, the, the 18th century, you have just, I'll just list some of the speakers that, that belong to this short period. There's no period in human history that has produced such a galaxy of, of, of thinkers. Galileo, Bacon, Descartes, Hobbes, Locke, Spinoza, Isaac Newton, D'Alembert, Lavoisier, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Voltaire, Rousseau, Holbach, Helvetius, Diderot, uh, this, and this is just um, some of the more brilliant amongst them. And there were others just as brilliant whose names completely slipped my mind. Um, so this was the spirit of the Enlightenment, right? And this was the brilliant, th these, were the, these were the brilliant thinkers that it produced. And it was a spirit that was appropriate to a period in which the capitalist class felt that it represented the future of civilization. 
It was an optimistic spirit when great revolutionary tasks were posed before that, that class. But of course, things moved on. Uh, the French Revolution came and went. It was followed by the Thermidorian reaction, the Napoleonic Wars, the Bourbon Restoration, uh, the, 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 the hell of, uh, of, of the suffering of the, 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 the working class and the industrial revolutions. And by the middle of the 19th century, the mood had changed amongst the capitalist class. By the time you have the 1848 revolution sweeping Europe, the capitalist class was more scared of the rising working class than they were interested, shall we say, in burying the remnants of feudalism that's still uh, are scattered about Europe. And in fact, they proved in that revolutionary wave that they were capable of coming to a, uh, an understanding with the counter-revolution. They played a counter-revolutionary role um, against the working class. And in the same way that they did that on the political plane, they increasingly were showing that they were capable of coming to a philosophical pact with the remnants of medievalism, with clericalism uh, uh, and uh, uh, reaction. And it's from this period, the middle of the 19th century, that you start to see the emergence in bourgeois philosophy of a strong anti-enlightenment trend. You have thinkers like Schopenhauer and Kierkegaard who reject the idea that there is a world out there to be known by reason. People like Schopenha uh, Schopenhauer reviving the idea that uh, all we have is appearances, representation, as he referred to it. We, only, we cannot know the, the, the world outside of, uh, of our representation, that we have our five senses, but uh, we can't know the world itself. Um, it's subjective idealism is being revived in philosophy. Um, Kierkegaard saying that all, reason cannot let us know the world. All we can really resort to is faith. This idea is, is once more revived. These reactionary, subject, inward-looking uh, philosophies are being revived. <clears throat> A fun fact about Schopenhauer. Um, in 1848, he was living in Frankfurt, which was one of the centers of the German Revolution in that year. And he actually allowed Prussian troops to use his balcony to shoot revolutionaries. So I just, I, I raise this point just to, to, to point out that he was a man rooted in his times and his ideas were reflected of the mood of his class, of the bourgeoisie, basically. Um, and it's, it's a pessimistic mood. It's an inward looking mood. It's a subjectivist uh, 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 outlook in which uh, you're surrounded by this hostile world that is uh, uh, out, out there and, and it, it bases itself on, the in, um, on extreme individualism which of course, by the end of the 19th century, now capitalism is really sputtering out its last progressive mission. Uh, you have the rise of monopolies, the rise of uh, colonialism and, and imperialism. You have the militarism across Europe, preparing the ground for, of course, what would become the First World War. And uh, uh, in, that, in that context, you have the extreme pessimistic individualistic philosophy of Nietzsche uh, expressing really the mood of the age, shall we say. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, this, it, for, for Nietzsche, uh, he was an atheist. He rejected God, but he also rejected science and he rejected both as forms of faith an extreme individualistic philosophy um, and a uh, questioning even of the benefits of uh, pursuing scientific investigation by Nietzsche. I'll bring some quotes in by him in a second. And in the 20th century, of course, now the real disaster is upon capitalism. We have school after school that rejects enlightenment, that rejects reason. Uh, the Frankfurt School, for the first time, so-called left-wingers, so-called Marxists, uh, rejecting the Enlightenment. And they, 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 they reflected the mood of the ruling class by this time, seeped in pessimism, and that pessimism seeping down into the petty bourgeois intelligentsia. And the, and the Fra Frankfurt School uh, uh, thinkers like uh, Adorno and Horkheimer, they, they wrote a, a famous book called uh, The Dialectic of Enlightenment. And fundamentally, they were saying, look around you. You know, um, what has Enlightenment and scientific thought brought you. It's brought you the Holocaust, it's brought you the atom bomb, and at least in the case of Adorno, it's brought you jazz music, which was, uh, <laughs> um, which he placed uh, uh, for some reason on a similar sort of pedestal. But um, yeah, I mean, the fundamental idea that they were saying is that science was supposed to be about liberating men, but actually it was about controlling, controlling nature, yes, but also controlling men and controlling the minds of men. And therefore, the end result of enlightenment is totalitarianism. It's, uh, it's the gulag of Stalin, the death camp of Hitler, and uh, American consumerism, which is controlling the minds of the masses through things like jazz music. Um, and, uh, and, and then, of course, by the, by the second half of the 20th century, you have the rise of postmodernism, which down to the present day and its offshoots, postmodernism and its offshoots, um, are, are dominant still on university campuses and particularly philosophy departments. Um, and they were inspired by people like Nietzsche and the Frankfurt School. 
And the rejection of the Enlightenment has become the mainstream philosophical position of bourgeois academia. Now, it would not be educational to you, nor pleasurable <laughs> for me to go into all of the differences of these different schools, these thinkers and so forth, um, that all have their own diverse theories and, 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 and little, little nuances. But in all, in one way or another, they all have the same fundamental uh, thing about them, which is they all revive idealism and specifically subjective idealism, this inward retreat. Um, and in all cases, it opens the door for mysticism. In place of the Enlightenment view, which is that there is an objective world out there, it exists independently of our minds, and it can be understood by reason and the senses and science, you have this inward retreat. Uh, there's only me. I, I have my senses. I can experience, I, I can see things, hear things, and so forth. But do I know that they tell me anything about the world? Do I even know that they tell me there is a world out there? Um, that is a, a question mark that is placed uh, above uh, uh, science by uh, these, these thinkers, these subjective idealists. Um, instead of that, I, I only have my own subjective truth. I know what I think, I know what I feel, but I cannot know if there is an objective truth out there. This is how Nietzsche put it. Now, Nietzsche has the advantage, the virtue, shall we say, uh, over uh, uh, most modern academic thinkers, that he, he at least tried to put a bit of poetry into his uh, pessimistic nonsense. Um, and he says the following, there are various eyes, even the Sphinx has eyes, and as a result, there are various truths. And as a result, there is no truth. So that's it, there is no truth. There are only many subjective viewpoints. Now, if you're familiar with postmodernism, this will sound very familiar to you. And that's not a coincidence because people like Foucault and Deleuze and these, uh, these people that are the touchstone of, uh, of, of postmodern thinking um, directly attribute and credit uh, Nietzsche as an important inspiration. They only change fundamentally the wording which is, you know, rather than, uh, you know, many eyes and all of this sort of stuff, they talk about, we all have our own narrative, right? I have my narrative in my head, you have your narrative in your head, stories basically. And we cannot privilege one narrative above another because to do so is anti-democratic, it's totalitarian and authoritarian. Um, and we can't say that one story is better than another, which is precisely what enlightenment thinking and science says, that this is the rational explanation and other explanations based upon superstition are false and incorrect. That's a meta-narrative, and that is something that they reject. Um, uh, 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 they, they reject, therefore, the idea of objective truth independent of the individual. Now, we can understand the, uh, the reasons for this. Uh, we can understand the reasons that uh, these, these theories have gripped academia and uh, university campuses in particular. It's a reflection of the fact that the capitalist system has become irrational, just like the feudal system was irrational. It has become irrational and their, their uh, uh, mood, therefore, has turned to pessimism, the deepest despair and pessimism. And it has seeped down into the, 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 the petty bourgeois layers who turn their back on rationality and reason. And they, they de develop all of these irrationalist philosophies. But all of these different philosophical schools, they don't just come out and say that. They try to justify what they, uh, uh, the, their point of view. And they do so by pointing to what they claim are the failures of the so-called Enlightenment project and of science. Now, Foucault in particular takes up these, uh, uh, th this, this uh, pointing out, shall we say, the failures of science and makes an entire career out of it. Um, and uh, in particular, pointing out where science has been wrong before. Hasn't science been false in the past? Haven't we had dead ends? Haven't we ended up at downright reactionary positions, which were the scientific consensus in the past? Uh, uh, particularly, he puts uh, um, uh, 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 psychiatry and the history of sexuality and these sort of things where downright reactionary views have been regarded as the scientific consensus in the past. And he puts them, uh, uh, and, and there's an implication, which Foucault is a very slippery fish. He never quite spells out his views entirely categorically, as I will come on to. But uh, there's an implication there that all scientific categories that we impose are more or less imposed by our ideas on nature, and they're all more or less arbitrary and can be disposed of and, and another set of views inserted in their place. And that really what they reflect is power relations. And he has this abstract notion of power relations, not the notion of, the, of state power or of class power, but power as an abstract thing coming from the mind, coming from our discourse and so on. Again, Nietzsche put it much clearer than Foucault or any of the rest of them ever did when he said the following, all things are subject to interpretation and whichever interpretation prevails at a given time is a function of power and not truth. That's, the, uh, that's the, the view. Now, yes, of course, science has been abused by uh, the capitalist class. 
uh, we, we can just point to the fact that in the 19th century, it was scientific consensus that there's a hierarchy of races, which was used to justify slavery, colonialism, and all the rest of it. But instead of blaming the ruling class, instead of blaming capitalism for straitjacketing science, what you end up with is the very notion stemming from the Enlightenment that science can attain truth that is, is regarded as false and, and rejected. And, in, uh, and they point to the fact, yes, uh, you know, there were things that were regarded as scientific fact yesterday that have today been proven to be totally false. Can we not thereby say that there will be scientific theories today which are regarded as true that in the future will be regarded as false? And of course, we will have to say, we will have to admit, yes, that is true. So how can we trust anything? That's the fundamental line of argument, basically. It's a line of argument that, uh, that takes itself, uh, that, that, that rests on the basis of an undialectical view of scientific progress, in the sense that it looks at each individual snapshot of science. Each theory is necessarily only an approximation to the, the, a description of the world. It only ever can achieve that, right? We never arrive at a complete state of science. Science is an infinite progression of closer and closer uh, um, uh, uh, approximation. And therefore, it also always necessarily contains a partial uh, falsehood. It also has a relative element to it as well. Now, does this mean that there is no th such thing as absolute truth? And we, as dialectical materialists, would deny that. We would say that actually that uh, it's not in the snapshot of science that we see the, 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 the whole truth, but it's in the progress of science by an infinite number of generations, of, or should I say an indefinite number of generations of scientists, arriving at a closer and closer approximation that we have the absolute truth, which has its basis in the material objectivity of the world. That's what gives it its absolute character, is our materialist position. And there's another sense in which I think that the postmodernists uh, become confused and these anti-enlightenment thinkers become confused. And that is that um, they don't understand the, the way that science progresses because science doesn't actually progress in a straight line. I think this is central to the whole point here. Um, all, the way that science progresses is it progresses through a process of negation in the sense that you have an old theory, right? Uh, it, sta it stands the test of time for a period and then a new theory comes about uh, a revolutionary theory that overthrows the old theory and uh, uh, takes its place. And uh, they take this to mean that you have one set of categories uh, which are imposed upon nature, and then they are basically overthrown completely and a new set of categories take their place. They see it as a complete negation of the old in a very formalistic sense, but that's not, it's a dialectical negation is the way that science progresses. And I'll, I'll try to explain what, what, what I mean by that. And this is where they, the difference between a formalistic and a, and a dialectical understanding of negation is very important. And I want to use the example of modern chemistry, which was, uh, which was born really in the, in the century of the Enlightenment, in the 18th century. Now, at the start of that century, alchemy was the dominant view within chemistry. You know, the philosopher's stone turning lead into gold and all of that sort of thing. It was very infused with mystical ideas. But by the end of the 18th century, you had what is recognizably very much like modern chemistry had emerged. But bridging the gap of the 18th century, you had a theory which rose early in the century and collapsed towards the end of the century known as the theory of phlogiston. <coughs> and this is based upon a very simple observation, right? Um, when something burns, it seems to emit something. It emits a flame, you know, red or yellow or whatever colored flame. And this theory was that that is a substance called phlogiston. Everything possesses it, and when it burns, it is emitted. It loses this phlogiston, right? Now, this was a theory that was eventually overturned. Um, but was the theory of phlogiston, therefore, uh, completely and utterly worthless? Well, no, actually, on the contrary, it was an enormous step forward. First of all, in the sense that even on the basis of a wrong theory, you can do a lot of good science. At the start of the 18th century, thousands of years of scientific investigation had discovered 15 chemical elements. By the end of that century, we had 41 chemical elements had been discovered. Um, so that in itself uh, proves something, I think. But more than that, in a more profound sense, the theory of phlogiston actually lives on in modern chemistry in the sense that if you take phlogiston and turn it upside down, so here you have a substance that is emitted and was calculated to have a negative mass. If you think of a substance that is absorbed and has a positive mass with all of the same attributes, you have oxygen which was precisely what was discovered by Lavoisier at the end of the 18th century. And in that sense, even a false idea can have a rational kernel. And the process of negation in science is not simply one of disposing of all old ideas in favor of a completely arbitrary new set of categories. 
Um, it is a process of, of, of negation, but at the same time of preservation of what is rational and separation of that rational kernel from the accidental and irrational um, uh, husk that it is contained within, uh, that, 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 that contains it. And it's precisely this inability to see the progress of science as a process and a contradictory process through the negation of the negation that leads to the idea of a lack of progress. It's the idea that one set of, uh, it's, just, it's just an arbitrary set of categories replaced with any other arbitrary set of categories. And actually this, this dialectical concept of negation of the negation is precisely vital to understanding the essence of what I'm trying to get across in this whole talk. Um, because uh, that's, that dialectical negation is precisely uh, vital to understanding our whole approach to the Enlightenment and to all of bourgeois culture, basically. Um, because the socialist revolution is not just about throwing out everything that capitalism has created. After all, under capitalism, uh, isn't it the case that, that machinery and industry are used to enslave the worker? Uh, that's very much, of course, true. But we don't thereby reject the whole of industry. We fight for the expropriation of the capitalist class by the working class, which will allow industry and technology to become a force for human liberation, for freeing us from drudgery and everything else. And so in that sense, capitalism has created the basis for communism by creating the basis for superabundance. And in the same way, all bourgeois culture and above all enlightenment, enlightenment thinking must be conquered, preserved, and at the same time freed of its class character by the proletariat after, as, as the preparation for a socialist uh, 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 culture, a higher culture, which, um, which will base itself not just on the rational kernel of enlightenment and scientific thinking, but the enormous cultural and, and scientific inheritance that has to be separated from that irrational kernel. And that's the difference between us and those who blindly reject the enlightenment and think that they can negate it in a, in a purely formalistic sense by rejecting it. By rejecting it in that way, because they point to all of the bad things that capitalist culture has about it, they embrace barbarism, which incidentally is precisely the direction that the capitalist class are taking us in anyway, um, fundamentally. Now, now Foucault, I'll give him this much, he was intelligent enough to understand that re by rejecting the idea of scientific progress, that leads you into a patently reactionary and absurd idea that medieval superstition is just as good at telling us about the world as modern astrophysics and, and theoretical physics and biochemistry and everything else. And uh, he, was not, he was too cowardly, should we say, to, to actually openly embrace that point of view. And instead, he actually explained his point of view in an essay called, titled, What is Enlightenment? In direct response to Kant's What is Enlightenment? Uh, where he says, uh, he refuses to say whether he accepts the Enlightenment or not. He says, the problem with the Enlightenment is it says that you're either on the side of reason and rationality or you're irrational and superstitious. And he says, I, he, says he rejects what he calls the blackmail of the Enlightenment, which is the most cowardly, mealy-mouthed way of saying that he embraces superstition, basically. Um, now, other of his followers are a little less cowardly and are prepared to precisely, uh, 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 openly reject the Enlightenment and scientific progress whatsoever. And I'll just take one example. Uh, an, an academic who says she is a follower of Foucault and, and disgracefully calls herself a Marxist feminist, and that is Silvia Federici. In her book, which I had <laughs> the pleasure of reading, uh, Caliban and the Witch, she says the following. She, well, she directly questions what she calls the belief in the socially progressive character of the scientific revolution. And she rejects Enlightenment thinking because she blames it for the subjugation of the workers the subjugation of women and colonial peoples under capitalism. But what does she end up doing by rejecting this Enlightenment thinking? And in particular, she, she, she's, has a, <laughs> she disgracefully treats Descartes and Hobbes in particular uh, in this kind of way. In fact, they're the only Enlightenment thinkers she cares to cherry pick from. Um, well, she ends up, first of all, glorifying the position of women and peasants under feudalism. First of all, embracing feudalism over capitalism in the first instance. And in place of science, she embraces magic and witch witchcraft. Um, and this is, this is what she says about magic and particularly whether, uh, whether, whether we can say that magic is real. And she calls herself a Marxist, by the way. So listen to this. It would not be fruitful to investigate whether these powers were real or imaginary. It can be said that all pre-capitalist societies have believed in them, and in recent times we've witnessed a revaluation of practices that at the time we refer to would have been condemned as witchcraft. Let us mention the growing interest in parapsychology and biofeedback that are increasingly applied even by mainstream medicine. 
So she's, she's arguing in favor of alternative medicine against science, and uh, she won't say whether she believes that witchcraft is actually real, whether power, whether magic is real. So, I mean, that's the, that's the logical conclusion of Foucault's ideas, to be honest. It's incredible. And um, what she accuses, basically what she accuses Enlightenment thinkers of doing, particularly Descartes, is of imposing a new vision of the body on society. They invent this new vision of the body, and uh, th they do this precisely in order to prepare the body for uh, exploit, capitalist exploitation. Because before you can exploit the body, you have to start thinking about it as a mechanism, either a mere mechanism, mechanical extension of the, uh, um, of the machine as the factory worker, or uh, as a baby-making machine as, as women uh, become under capitalism. And this vision, she then says, was first of all developed by these thinkers and then enforced by state violence. And what, where, does, where, where does Federici identify the state violence which is backing up Enlightenment thought? In the witch trials, in the burning of 80,000 witches in Europe was supposedly the imposition of this, uh, it was all about uh, basically uh, 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 driving out the idea that the body has anything spiritual or magical about it in order to, to, uh, to, to create raw material for exploitation. So you have this situation where she says that those fighting for reason and science and rationality and the religious fanatics burning witches were one reactionary block, which is the biggest slander and the most absurd slander that you can throw at these uh, Enlightenment thinkers. And what is more, it is a completely idealist notion of how capitalism arose. Uh, it presents the, str the struggle of ideas as the locomotive of history and bad ideas were responsible for the rise of capitalism, which is completely and utterly turning things on its head. Um, now, uh, Foucault doesn't, in fact, draw things quite to this logical conclusion. Um, in fact, again, this slippery fish uh, says that uh, he actually stands in the, in, the, in the tradition of the Enlightenment. In what sense? In this same article that I referred to, he says that he, uh, you see, he maintains the same skeptical approach. You see, Enlightenment thought was all about skepticism, right? Um, didn't they, after all, adopt a skeptical approach to the received wisdom of their days, the received ideas of their days, and, and he just does the same. Well, let's look at uh, a particular uh, uh, Enlightenment thinker who's well known, uh, one of the fathers of the Enlightenment, Descartes, who is, uh, who's, who's uh, treated so disgracefully by Federici. Uh, he's well known for his skeptical approach uh, to the thinking of the day. He regarded it as his duty to doubt everything. And he declared that nine-tenths of the received wisdom that had come down from the medieval ages um, was trash based upon dogma, faith, and superstition. And he declared that he was going to sweep all of this away um, and rebuild no human knowledge on the basis of reason, starting from what he describes as a few simple self-evident truths that he would be left with. And of course, we know what, what those simple self-evident truths, they include, included the, favorite, the, the famous dictum, I think, therefore I am. Now, doesn't that sound a bit like the postmodernist? I think, therefore, I am. It's very inward-looking. It's very uh, subjectivist uh, uh, notion. Well, um, yeah, maybe uh, uh, superficially, but the diff here's the difference uh, fundamentally. Um, Foucault says that he is also a skeptic, right? He says he also takes a skeptical attitude towards uh, and, and casts doubt on the received wisdom of his day. But he is casting doubt on the possibility of science and of knowing the world. Whereas uh, Descartes cast doubt on faith and superstition from the optimistic point of view that he could, on the basis of reason, come to understand the world. Now, of course, it's very easy to point to the limits of Descartes uh, and, and his philosophy, but it's completely and utterly, they are the inverse, they are the complete and utter opposite of each other. And I will also say this in answer to Federici, Foucault was able to espouse his skeptical views towards science and reason from the comfy position of a university chair. Descartes had to do so from self-imposed exile in France because his views were regarded as too dangerous in his day, far from the state being the ones that carried out his views into practice. Um, he, his views were uh, fundamental. He, 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 he earns the undying hatred of the church and of the established uh, powers. By elevating faith, sorry, reason over faith, uh, they, 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 uh, they completely despised these views and the church attempted to stamp them out for 60 years after his death. His view, it was forbidden to teach Descartes' views, uh, not just in France, but also in the Netherlands, where he had a relatively free atmosphere, relatively, in those days. And others amongst Descartes' uh, uh, followers were even more, were even bolder in, in their point of view. Um, these are the real uh, continuators of the, uh, of the Enlightenment, people like Spinoza. Now, um, uh, Descartes, uh, uh, yeah, yeah he, fa he, t he took up the, he, he famously believed, of course, that the world is separated in two. He had a dualistic view. 
He saw the material world as being very mechanical, following the mechanical laws of motion. But there's also another realm of spirit, of, uh, of thought, basically. And there was a separation between the two. But his follower, Spinoza, completely abolished that separation. And he believed there was only one substance in this world. Um, and yes, it has the qualities that are describable by mechanical motion of, of speed, penetrability, extension, and so on. But it also has infinite other qualities, including the possibility, the potential for thought and sensation. And he called this one substance God or nature. It was a kind of pantheism, but it was a pantheism in form only, because if you say that God is everything, you're basically saying that God is nothing. And this was, uh, this was dangerous stuff in those days. Um, if you just change, in fact, the, the word God or nature to matter, you have a fully consistent, worked out materialist point of view, a materialist doctrine that was a consciously revolutionary, in Spinoza's case, a consciously revolutionary challenge to the religious authorities of his day. Particularly because, as I say, religion provided the justification of all of the regimes that dominated Europe. And so it was a challenge to the state to hold an idea like this. And let's listen to how Spinoza, these real brave revolutionary thinkers put things forward. He says, it may indeed be the highest secret of monarchical government and utterly essential to it to keep man deceived and to disguise the fear that sways them in the, with the specious name of religion so that they will fight for their servitude as if they were fighting for their own deliverance and will not think it humiliating but supremely glorious to spill their blood and sacrifice their lives for the glorification of a single man. Now, consider the context. This was extremely revolutionary stuff. And he was persecuted. Like all of these thinkers, they were not the ones doing the persecuting. They were not the totalitarian, uh, uh, authoritarian thinkers. These were fighters for human liberty prepared to pay the ultimate sacrifice. And long after his death, if you were denounced as a Spinozist in the, in the 18th century, uh, that was tant tantamount to being called an atheist, a materialist, a Republican Democrat, and a revolutionary, a subversive, an enemy of the state, basically. That was what it was to be a follower of, of, of Spinoza. And the materialist spirit of men like Spinoza, that was the spirit of the age. <clears throat> it was a spirit that, that drew upon the great scientific advances of people like Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and so forth. It, it produced other materialist schools this age of enlightenment. You had the, the, the English philosophers like Bacon, Hobbes, and Locke. They were far from radicals. Uh, Bacon in particular, uh, um, was, uh, he, he, he developed the, uh, the philosophical basis for the scientific method. Um, but when these ideas were transferred to France, uh, where the, the Ancien Regime had become so rotten and the existing material conditions were demanding to, uh, a criticism under Enlightenment thought, under the basis of reason and a materialist method, it, it, it provided the source of tremendous revolutionary inspiration. Uh, this, this materialist doctrine from Spinoza and from the English empiricists had an electrifying effect on the thinkers, the boldest thinkers in pre-revolutionary in, in pre France. And these thinkers, uh, you had among them uh, men like Diderot. Uh, they explained that there was no need for, for God to give us uh, morality. Um, it's our material needs and our senses that explain our morality. Um, and it's, our, it's, it's, it's the social well-being of society that creates the, the moral sense of what is right and wrong. And, and Diderot used the example. If you are blind, the idea of... Uh, of indecent nudity is going to be is, is is meaningless to you. So clearly, the senses have a lot to do with our morality. It's not there's nothing God given that makes it immoral to go around with no clothes on. It's uh, it's it's our material conditions, our, our, our material reality. And what conclusions did they come to? People like Diderot, um, on the basis of a materialist approach, he didn't conclude that we need to t turn workers into mechanisms for exploit exploitation and so forth. He concluded that slavery is immoral. Homosexuality is not immoral. The, this in the middle of the 18th century, incredible views for which he was sent to prison in 1749. And even after his release from prison, he continued his work, as did many of these uh, 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 revolutionary thinkers, all working on this project called the Encyclopedia, the aim of which was to gather all of the scientific knowledge across Europe and to use it like a giant torch to clear the fog of superstition. They brought these ideas together as brilliant <clears throat> There's, there's incredible wit as well about these people, how far they stand from these, these academics who uh, um, are complete, completely and utterly uh, impenetrable. They don't want to be read and they don't want to be understood. Nietzsche in particular said, I don't want to be understood. I mean, they wrote it in black and white. And they, the, the modern academics don't want to be understood because they want to keep these ideas from the masses. It's their academic preserve. 
They're more like the scholastics against whom the Enlightenment thinkers were fighting, these, these people that were defenders of faith and superstition in the Middle Ages. Um, on the contrary, this is, these, these works are full of wit and verve. Uh, uh, there's so much life in these works of these great revolutionary thinkers of the French Enlightenment. Uh, in fact, uh, in, in 1920, Lenin said, we should republish the French materialist writings and redistribute them amongst the, the, the Russian workers and peasants because they are better atheist propaganda than nine-tenths of what we're capable of producing. Incredible stuff. If you read two books at the end of this, you should read The History of Philosophy here, and you should read D'Alembert's Dream by Diderot, which is the, one of the most beautiful and astonishing uh, expositions of materialism, and very close to dialectics. Uh, Diderot in particular was, was, came very close to a dialectical outlook. Um, these men, yeah, far from uh, uh, um, uh, being a totalitarian philosophy, it was about human beings liberating themselves. Um, it was about dispelling superstition through works like the encyclopedia. They fervently hated aristocracy. They hated inequality and injustice, even when the capitalist class were guilty of it. People like Holbach, the great French material, well, German materialist who lived in France, he was of the same uh, uh, group. He hated England. <laughs> Okay, but <laughs> not not because he had any bitterness towards English people, but because the, the 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 rise of trade and industry had brought about tremendous inequality. So they were bourgeois thinkers, yes, but they did not have bourgeois limitations. These were extremely humanistic thinkers and revolutionaries. And in fact, it is directly towards French materialism that we can trace modern communism. So it's in the it's in the Enlightenment that we find the roots of our own uh, tradition. And uh, after all, the, the materialists were arguing, um, it's not nature that makes men evil. It's, it's evil institutions and evil conditions that, that mold us, that condition us. And therefore, if you want to create a heaven on earth, you need to overthrow evil conditions and evil, super, and, and, and evil institutions. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a revolutionary philosophy is fundamentally what I'm saying. And you even had some amongst them who, believing they were applying pure reason to the material conditions, arrived at the conclusion that there was no, in the middle of the 18th century, I'm not talking about the utopian socialists, I'm talking about people like, uh, and forgive my pronunciation, uh, Abbe de Marbley, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> who argued that there is nothing, reason cannot erect an argument against redistributing property and introducing communism. Um, this was in the 18th century, this is far advanced. They were looking beyond the bourgeois revolution, they were groping beyond that. Now it is of course, um, it, is, it is, of course, uh, uh, of, of course, we do have our criticisms of Enlightenment thought. And above all, the main limitation of Enlightenment thinking was that it was metaphysical rather than dialectical. Uh, by and large, people like Diderot and certain writings by people like Rousseau, they, they did contain elements of dialectics. But the main limitation was precisely that, as I said previously, what was the main unifying theme of the Enlightenment? Human beings are naturally endowed with reason. But reason is not something that maybe we are all naturally endowed with the potential for reason. But reason is something that has developed over thousands of years of mankind gaining greater and greater control over nature and understanding over nature. So it's a historically arrived at uh, place. It's not as if, and this is, the, this is the conclusion you could draw if you believe that human beings are endowed with reason. All that would have been necessary would have been for some great thinkers to come along 300 years before and we could have had the Enlightenment in the, the 14th century instead of the, 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 the 18th century. No, they didn't understand things as a, as a process of development. They didn't see history. Historical development in particular was something that was a bit beyond their horizon. Because after all, the development, such was the development of science that even the earth itself was not regarded as having a history. That, that, that people like Newton advocated that the earth had been spinning around the sun for all eternity. Um, and uh, there was, the geology was in its infancy, the idea that the earth has a history. Biology was even more in, in, in its infancy. They were still collecting all of the data, all of specifying the different species and, and, uh, uh, and genera and so forth. In fact, read that book by Diderot, I highly recommend it. He anticipates evolution. They, they, they're groping beyond even the limits of their day. He talks about the idea that species perhaps did have a history, but they were limited by their day. And in particular, they were limited by the fact that uh, uh, the, the, the tasks posed before humanity were those of the bourgeois revolution. And they could, no long, they could not go beyond the limits of their day, right? They, they were anal materialistically anal analyzing uh, man in the abstract, right? They were talking about man in the abstract, the rights of man and so forth. Um, but in actual fact, we were, we were talking about specific men in, specific, in a specific epoch, in the bourgeois epoch. And their ideas could only find realization, of course, 
in the bourgeois republic and in a new form of exploitation. They couldn't have, uh, have, have gone beyond that because there was no other force in society upon which they could base themselves. So it had, it had a certain abstract anti undialectical character. And in that sense, the anti-Enlightenment thinkers have all of the vices and none of the virtues of the Enlightenment because they lack dialectics even more so. There aren't the brilliant elements of dialectics that you see in Diderot or Rousseau in these thinkers. They, they, they are, as I mentioned previously, they don't understand the Enlightenment precisely because they don't have dialectics and they start from a subjective idealist point of view. And it was precisely in the, uh, uh, in, in the Enlightenment thinking that we find the roots of our own tradition of, 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 of Marxism. It's from French materialism that you have the birth of communism. The great utopian socialists were directly inspired and, and based themselves on the philosophy of French materialism. Instead of feudalism being irrational, they regarded capitalism as irrational and they critiqued it from that point of view. That was a key source and inspiration of Marxism. The great uh, uh, political uh, economists, uh, Smith and Ricardo, were men of the Enlightenment who for the first time subjected capitalism to a scientific analysis. Marx just took that to its conclusion. And of course, the rediscovery of dialectics in the modern era uh, can trace its roots through Kant into the German idealist tradition, which is also fruit of the Enlightenment, of the greatest thinkers that the bourgeois class has produced. So we, we owe a direct debt of gratitude to Enlightenment philosophy and we defend it against those people that say forward to barbarism, uh, or they would do if they had any uh, ounce of sincerity and honesty about them. And uh, uh, yes, I'll leave the word, last words now to Trotsky because I've gone to 45 minutes, but I didn't go to 50 minutes. <laughs> uh, and this is from his uh, 1924 pamphlet, Literature and Revolution. And in it, he's arguing against those communists in Russia who precisely wanted an, uh, to, to discard all bourgeois culture in the name of a proletar a, 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 some sort of supposed proletarian culture that would start from zero, which as I mentioned is precisely, is not how, how, how culture develops, it's through negation of the negation. And he explained the following, and I think it's a very striking summary of, of what I'm trying to get across, much better, much better than I could express it. He says, if there had been no working class with its strikes, struggles, sufferings, and revolts, there would of course have been no scientific communism because there would have been no historical necessity for it. But its theory was formed entirely on the basis of bourgeois culture, both scientific and political, though it declared a fight to the finish upon that culture. Under the pressure of capitalistic contradictions, the universalizing thought of the bourgeois democracy of its boldest, most honest and most far-sighted representatives rises to the height of a marvelous renunciation armed with all the critical weapons of bourgeois science. Such is the origin of Marxism. That's all for this week's Marxist Voice, but before we go, a few announcements. First, if this talk piqued your interest, then you should get a copy of Reason in Revolt from Well Read Books, which shows how the advances in modern science like chaos theory, the human genome project, and quantum mechanics are consistent with the dialectical materialist philosophy worked out by Marx and Engels. Link in the show notes down below. Second of all, if you are a consistent revolutionary materialist, then you should not be content with just twiddling your thumbs listening to a podcast. You should get organized and build a revolutionary organization that can carry these ideas into the living class struggle. Nine weeks remain until the founding Congress of the Revolutionary Communist Party. So if you have not already joined, do so today. Go to communist.red where you can write in to get in contact with your local branch, subscribe to our paper, The Communist, and donate to our party launch fund of £20,000. Once again, that's communist.red, link in the show notes. We'll be back next week with another episode, so we'll see you next time on Marxist Voice, podcast of the communists in Britain. <laughs>